This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Pollster and political pundit John Zogby on this edition of Conversations. The name John Zogby is synonymous with presidential polling in American politics. Zogby's national prominence accelerated in 1996 with his exceptional accuracy in calling the presidential election. In 2000, he accurately predicted a closer presidential election than many had anticipated. Currently, he is a senior analyst for Jay-Z Analytics. He also writes for Forbes.com, The Washington Times, and Politics Magazine. Zogby is an in-demand speaker and corporate consultant for blue chip companies like IBM and Coca-Cola. He is the author of the best-selling book, The Way We Will Be, The Zogby Report on the Transformation of the American Dream. We welcome John Zogby to Conversations. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jeff. You're a busy guy. I am busy, <laughs> and I want your folks to know I, uh, 04, 06, 08, 2010, we, we nailed them, so, so we're okay. Well, well you, you are considered one of the more accurate in the business. What makes an accurate poll? Well, if we're talking politics, mm -hmm. you're talking about likely voters, and you're talking about a sample then that closely approximates what the, the electorate is going to look like. And so we take a, a very special, make very special attention to um, you know, ensuring that the sampling is right, and of course that the questions are asked right. Th that's one of the things that's been talked about a lot in the media is how the questions are phrased. What's the key to that? Well, you know, if you're talking basically who would you vote for if the election were held today, I think we all do the, the very same thing. We try to go uh, an extra st uh, step forward and try to, you know, get into what people's values are, where their heart and soul is. Mm -hmm. So we're going to ask them not simply who'd be better at, at handling the economy, Obama or, or Romney, or who'd be better at handling foreign affairs, but put questions into a, a context to suggest that one side of foreign policy would tweak this value, freedom and democracy, uh, a recognition that the, the American empire is maybe declining, mm -hmm. uh, while the other alternative would be that it's America first, American exceptionalism, um, you know, that it's our way and the highway. I'm maybe embellishing a little bit. Right. But the point being that we try to get, uh, try to, to associate with uh, four people, you know, what each policy represents that might be near and dear to them and try to get that accurate reading on who they are. How do you go about gathering the sample? In other words, how do you get the people? Well, you know, we have a multiplicity of ways these days. That, you know, Jeff, I go back to 1984 when we used to hear, shh, I have a long distance call. This is very important. Those days don't exist. <laughs> right. Believe me, they don't exist anymore. So, you know, we do live calls, and then a third of those calls have to be, you know, to cell phones. Mm -hmm. um, we do online surveys where we have a broad list of um, pre-screened uh, uh, email addresses, you know, with people's uh, um, uh, e uh, data, uh -huh. you know, uh, and, and, and then we ensure that we get an adequate sample. But the point is we try to do as close to what we call probability sampling as possible. Uh, in other words, that every household in the U.S. has the same chance of being selected as any other household. Then when we're all done, we know that there are some groups that are usually underrepresented, okay. you know, minorities. Okay. Generally, there's a, a suspicion uh, uh, about taking a survey. Young people, for example, less inclined to spend time. So we will apply you know, a weight or an adjustment to make sure that they're adequately represented in, in, in our sample. Cell phones, I keep hearing that, you know, the, the polls seem to be different when talking to people on cell phones versus the landlines. Why is that? Well, you have a younger skew, mm -hmm. for starters, and it's growing exponentially. So, th you know, we're, in many ways, we're standing on tectonic plates here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and trying to, in our industry as well as so many other right. industries, trying to get a handle on it. But, you know, generally it's going to skew younger. And so... 
if you don't have an adequate cell phone only representation, then you're not polling younger people adequately. And younger people are very, very different um, in, in, in a myriad of ways. Um, they're more global in, term, uh, in terms of their, their sensibilities. They're more libertarian in terms of their leanings. Uh, they will favor Obama over Romney uh, because of social issues. Mm. Let's talk about the changing demographics and maybe just as important, if not more importantly, the changing psychographics of this country. Mm. Elaborate. Well, um, you know, when I first started, old people, that's me now, <laughs> um, but, you know, people in their uh, 65 and older were New Deal, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Well, now old older people um, are what's left of those kids that grew up during World War II and into the 50s, the Cold War, um, and basically tend to be very conservative, mm -hmm. tend to favor a very strong foreign policy, not in favor of government spending except defense. For, for defense and Medicare and um, Social Security. So. That's one change. The other change is that you have this growth of the younger voter, 18 to 33 years of age, be born between 1979 and 1994, and generally a bit libertarian, not very trustful of government, but in terms of social issues, leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Don't get into my bedroom, get into my private life, and I, I'm not very trustful of government. In between, you have a burgeoning new group of older Americans, baby boomers, and they're going to skew things considerably because uh, on one hand, they will have values as parents mm -hmm. and as grandparents. On the other hand, they grew up in the 60s. Right. And, so, and then you have the group uh, normally we call Generation X. But I call them Nikes. Nikes. The, this is a group that, that came of age uh, Watergate, Roe v. Wade, uh, Arab oil embargo, shortages, stagflation, uh, divorce rates as previously never seen, and, and just grew up into a world where everything around them seemed to be falling apart. So just do it. Mm -hmm. Hence do the it. Nikes. Yeah. You mentioned the libertarians, and it seems like there are an awful lot of people out there who sort of like that political way of thinking. Why hasn't it gained more traction on a national basis? Well, we have two parties that are embedded, and so that provides a certain kind of stability. Let's think more broadly, and not to be offensive, I, I'm just a, just a guy that views these things, but there have been Catholic Church scandals. There have been Boy Scouts. Have they been damaged? Oh, absolutely. Have the institutions been damaged? Is there less confidence? Yes. But there are people who always still need a sense of stability. In other words, they have to find go mm -hmm. on the Monopoly board, right. or they have to, um, you know, find some something that gives them some security and tradition. The Democrats and the Republicans are, are at their lowest point in confidence that I've ever seen, including Watergate. Mm -hmm. I go back a long way. But today there's a sense that the, the two parties are not in existence to perform what really most people are looking for, problem solving, consensus building. Why do you think that is? That the parties are not mm -hmm. prepared? Well, I think that they're locked into a mode of thinking inside the beltway. Um, there is a structural pattern that says, no matter how you got elected, when you get here in town, you follow the leader. If you don't follow the leader, you don't get rewarded. If you uh, don't follow the leader and get rewarded, then you become a junior congressman or a junior senator. You're not able to deliver for your district what you're supposed to do. You don't get into a leadership position. So there's almost a lockstep. It's a, a different set of skills required to get elected in your district than it is to survive in Washington. 
and in Washington, I, I really believe we're at a point of, of a cognitive threshold, uh, which is essentially we have a mode of thinking that's old fashioned, mm -hmm. but we have problems that are just too complex and diverse. We need a whole new mode of thinking. Seems to me the ideologues on each end of the spectrum, whether it's the left or whether it's the right, are pretty much controlling the parties. Yes. And, and that's a small group. It is a small group, and in terms of voters, people will line up one way or another, but the critical mass of people are saying, we really want two things. And I, I started hearing this in late 2006. The critical mass of voters are saying, we want problem solving and consensus building. Mm -hmm. And neither of the parties are prepared to give that. So in the longer term, are we okay? Sure. In the short term, are we okay? No. We've got some challenges ahead of us, yeah. the fiscal cliff. What do you think is going to happen with that? I have no idea. However, if there is a fiscal cliff, it's awful. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, you know, your, your viewers know it as well as, as I know it, but basically you're talking about no agreement on new revenues and too much uh, uh, spending cuts. Look, we all want to reduce waste. Right. But when you have a private sector that has slowed down in terms of its growth and you've got millions of private sector workers out of work, is this the time to be eliminating two million government workers? So fiscal cliff is disastrous. It will destroy our bond rating, our ability to borrow money. Um, it'll create greater deficits. It'll cause a recession at least as bad, if not worse than what we've already seen. What do you think it is going to take for the two parties to come together and say, let's do what's best for the country as opposed to what's best for politics? It all starts, and, and you know the president made this point, um, and that's not, it's not an endorsement of the president, but the president says change doesn't come inside the beltway. The demand comes from outside the beltway. There has to be a hue and cry from the people who, who don't rely on Fox and don't rely on NBC, MSNBC, right, right. who are in the middle. That's where the network is needed. That's where people say, look, enough already. We're the taxpayers. We're the public employees. This isn't working for us. We need a solution. We need it now. Uh, in, in other words, uh, November 6th. The election. A statement has to be made. A statement has to be made. As you travel the country, I know you speak a lot, what are people telling you? Um, they're scared, but just in the last few weeks, there's a sense that maybe things are getting better. They're convinced that Washington, D.C. is not their friend, but frankly, neither is Tallahassee, neither is Albany, neither is Sacramento. Right. Um, there is a genuine distrust in government at all levels, with the exception of maybe my city mm -hmm. or, or my town, but a real sense that, that, that things are broke. Yeah. You mentioned some of the states and, for that matter, some of the municipalities. Um, they have some real challenges mm -hmm. as far as budgetary concerns, uh, the looming pension problems. What do you make of that and how does that get fixed? You know, these are not new. These are things, that I, I was an activist before I became a pollster. These are things we were talking about in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. You know, there was not a will to deal with it. First of all, I've learned from <clears throat> talking to people at the hundreds and thousands, and now at the hundreds of thousands at a time, uh, that they're much more mature than we give them credit for. That if Democrats and Republicans were to sit down and to say to the American people, you know what, we've got to cut some, we've got to increase taxes some, this is a national crisis, they'll do it. Why do I know that? Because they've sacrificed for war. Right. No one ever thought, and I was there, no one ever thought people would recycle or right. stop littering. Oh, I go back to the days when we used to see this. You know, yeah. people tossing out garbage out in the streets. Stop smoking? Yeah, yeah. 
oh, come on, you'll never get people to, you'll destroy the restaurant business. Right. Now people, even smokers go into restaurants and they say, yeah. oh, thank God. That's right. But the point is, if you treat people as they are, people who've already made sacrifices, they're willing to make more sacrifices if it's the common good and if they're sure that their neighbor is going to do the same thing. Do you think the media perpetuates that back and forth anger, that hate between the Democratic and Republican Party? Does the media perpetuate that? Well, to be very honest with you, sure. You know, what's the story? Uh, dog bites man or man bites dog? Right, exactly. Okay. You know, and, and frankly, then, um, it, the silent majority, as Nixon mm -hmm. pointed out, don't have their own network. And what they're left with then are reality shows, yeah. you know, and entertainment. And, and frankly, I guess I can't blame them. You know, two jobs, getting the kids to school, um, saving money, whatever that is, uh, all of that stuff means you're not ready to sit down at 9 o'clock and listen to people yelling at each other, you know. Yeah. But essentially, if, if people want problems solved, they really have to take the responsibility themselves. Um, and not in an ideological way because we are at uh, such an equilibrium that what it is is a gridlock. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 2008, voters want to change. And that was a good thing. But they never gave a direction to that change. And so there was the difficulty. And frankly... John McCain, who I thought in some ways could have won the presidency had he been John McCain of 2000, running in 2008, would have found the same exact problem that Barack Obama did, which is that, that, that gridlock has just uh, taken over our capacity to solve problems out of Washington, D.C. As you look forward the upcoming election, um, as we tape this broadcast, um, things are rapidly changing. But what's your sense of where it will end up? And oh, I think it's very close. You know, there are moments, in fact, there are a lot of historical parallels, but let's take the 2000 parallel. I, th I think it's along those lines. Because on one hand, I, you know, the president has had a good convention. Um, he's doing well, better in the polls, but you know, there's still 54, 55% who are saying the country's headed in the wrong direction. There's still as many people who say he doesn't deserve election, re-election, as say he does deserve re-election. So we're at an equilibrium. The issue right now, and the burden right now, is less on Barack Obama. Uh, half the voters kind of have made up their minds about Obama, but is Mitt Romney worth voting for? Right. And that's what we're going to see play out over the next few weeks. This is not just me talking. I was recently at a conference, heard some very astute folks, David Gergen being one of them, talking. And by all accounts, Romney should really have a, a, a strong lead, mm -hmm. one would think, because of the economics that are going on in this country and his economic background. Why doesn't he? There's a bonding problem. We've had rich guys who've been president. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know that people know this. Abe Lincoln was making $50,000 a year in the 1850s as a corporate attorney. <laughs> That's a lot of money in the 1850s. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, I extrapolate it. But, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Jack Kennedy. Mm -hmm. But every one of these guys had a capacity to bond and be able to, see, you know, Teddy was very ill, almost died in his 20s, lost his wife at the age of 26. He wrote, um, the light went out of my life. Franklin was in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. you know. Jack Kennedy, a war hero with a, a bad back, you know, highly medicated. These are the sorts of things, and Jack Kennedy w could walk into a room and people used to say, you could feel his presence if your back was to the door. Mitt doesn't have that. 
Um, there's something missing. You know, and ultimately, take another rich kid, you know, George W. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the guy that folks wanted to have the beer with. Now, you may want to say, that was my question, incidentally, my contribution to American culture. Um, you can say, well, what's that got to do with the presidency? Well, it has a lot to do with, we're not just electing a manager administrator. You hire one of those. What you're doing actually is electing someone who you think really understands who you are, what you're about, has gone through. You know, W didn't like to talk about alcoholism, but it was unstated, and folks could, you know, it, they may not have been alcoholics, mm -hmm. but they kind of understood, hey, this guy has triumphed. He's gone through something I have. I, I just don't think they get that sense from them. It's a likability issue. Oh, it's very much. You have to like the messenger before you listen to the message. That's what Ronald Reagan had to learn. Mm -hmm. Who is this old guy? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know that people remember, but Jimmy Carter led in that election, and then it was very close, running right up to Saturday before the election in November of 1980. Mm -hmm. And then Sunday, the dam broke, mm -hmm. burst. Why, you know, well... Do we want this old guy right next to that black box? Mm -hmm. And isn't he a little trigger happy? But then they said, no, that's Ronald Reagan. We know, you yeah. know, nice guy, actor. Yeah. Hey. And they became comfortable with him. They became comfortable. Yeah. And for whatever reason, Romney just has not been able to make that connection because he not seems yet. like a nice guy, but he just, I guess there's, there's a difference between being a nice guy and, be, and having that... Uh, charisma that Reagan had or, or, That's or right. Clinton for that matter. You know, it hurt John McCain in 2008 when he couldn't answer the question, how many homes yeah, yeah, do you have? Yeah. On the other hand, five and a half years in a prison of war, exactly. prisoner of war, um, cell, um, come on, this guy can understand who I am. Absolutely, absolutely. The House and Senate, thoughts on how that's going to turn out? Yeah, it's not the slam dunk that everybody thought it was going to be months ago. You know, things have really tightened up. So, you know, uh, six, seven months ago, it was looking like, it, you know, the Republicans had the Senate. They'd hold on to the House. They'd win the presidency. All of that could still happen. There are no predictions here. But er, where we are today, it's within the realm of real possibility that the, the Democrats hold on to the Senate the, and that they pick up double digits in the House. But we have mixed government again. You said something earlier I want to go back to, and you said, you know, short-term things are challenging to say the least. Long-term, you're very optimistic. What are you optimistic about? I'm optimistic particularly about young people. Uh, you know, a lot of them uh, have had some difficulties. The recession has worn on, you know, when you're 27 and all you've known since you were 22 uh, were tougher times. That's difficult. Uh, Singas is a group that I'm looking at, college educated, not going anywhere. But I'm also looking at what I call America's first globals. Those born between 1979, 1994, who have a planetary sensibility that none of us have. Mm -hmm. they, their network, their, their sensibility, their uh, worldview is global. Um, secondly, there's something about them, their way of, of making decisions and solving problems is different. Mm -hmm. You and I, not to put you in my age group, but sorry. Uh, <laughs> but basically, you and I have a, a, a vertical orientation. There's a problem. I talk to my supervisor. Mm -hmm. My supervisor talks to his manager, who talks in turn to her vice president. And then somehow that problem just disappears up the chain somewhere. These kids are in horizontal. There's a, a problem. I need it solved. I need it solved now and I do it via my network. Mm -hmm. And somehow within hours or days, that solution not only comes back, but there's a critical mass solution. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like that so much more than the structure that we have. Unemployment in, in about two minutes here. 
I personally believe, and you tell me if, if, if you think I'm right, that uh, much of our unemployment problem is more of a structural issue than it is perhaps an economic issue in the fact that there's an awful lot of wagon wheel makers out there and we're not making wagon wheels anymore. Right. Would you agree? Oh, no, I, I would. In every recession that we've had, 73, 82, 91, 07 are structural recessions. What's happening, those tectonic plates, we're moving away from a certain economy towards a, a new economy. This one in 07 and 08, though, was the final mm -hmm. in the string in the sense that we know the new economy. It's biotechnology. It's nanotechnology. It's as I was talking to you before the show, you're telling me about your very talented 11-year-old. It's the right brain. Yeah. They will rule the world. How do we get through the next two or three years? is the question. We're fine. We just got to, we, the next two years. It's going to be challenging. Very. I want to mention your book real quick. It's entitled the, uh, the Way We Will Be, the Zogby Report on the Transformation of the American Dream in about 30 seconds. Give me a synopsis. I look at all these things, America's first globals and, and the Nike generation and the baby boomers, I call us Woodstockers. But I also look at the growing trend and it's growing hugely away from excess materialism and towards a secular, what I call secular spiritualism, that desire to to want to live a life of meaning. Right, right. Just anecdotally speaking, I see that in some of the young people. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, 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 it's definitely a change. You write for Forbes.com, mm -hmm. so people can find you on a weekly basis? Uh, weekly basis on, on Forbes.com, The Washington Times. Dot com and, uh, and uh, jzanalytics.com. jzanalytics.com and uh, you guys will have some, I'm sure, opinions as far as we get as, as we get closer to the election. We have on. the public's opinions, and I, I have a few of my own. Yeah, a few of your own. <laughs> John Zogby, what a pleasure. Same here, Jeff. Thank Enjoyed you. it. Thanks. Nice. Best of luck to you. Give you one more plug on that book because it sounds interesting. The way we will be: the Zogby Report on the Transformation of the American Dream. Um, definitely some challenges out there, but also, as Mr. Zogby pointed out, an awful lot of fascinating and exciting things happening in the future. We thank you so very much for watching this edition of Conversations. You can find many more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. All you have to do is click on the Episodes tab. And I want to send out a very special thanks to our friends at the Panhandle Tiger Bay Club for their assistance in putting this program together. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take good care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.